So, uh, just acknowledgement. So I'm acknowledging that I am on Woiwurrung country, which is right down here. Uh, everybody can see my cursor wavering, hopefully. Um, and paying my respects to the elders who've accumulated 65,000 years plus of knowledge of this continent, which is incredible in itself. When you think about how new uh, us uh, white folk have been on this continent. Um, anyway, so just acknowledging the elders and paying respects to them and the elders uh, emerging um, and just acknowledging the land was stolen and sovereignty is never ceded. Um, so why degrowth? Just a little bit of an explanation before we get into the goonery. Uh, degrowth refers to a set of theories and a powerful growing social and economic movement that critique the paradigm of endless economic growth. Endless economic growth is not possible on this finite, beautiful planet we have. Uh, the idea of degrowth is that wealthy economies should move past the growth of GDP as our society's goal, scale down destructive and unnecessary forms of production to reduce energy and material use, and focus economic activity on securing human needs within the boundaries of bioregional and planetary ecological well-being. Degrowth is a purposeful strategy to create localized, socially just, and ecologically centered societies and economies. And just a little bit of a rundown of the other, other sessions we've got this week. Uh, have a quick look. We've got three today um, after this one. No, we've got two today after this one. Uh, uh, another two tomorrow and another one on Friday. So please come along. Uh, this thing just keeps getting in the way. How do I shift that? Oh, there we go. And so just a quick explain, our degrowth network uh, of Australia is a place for people who want to or are already acting, organising and campaigning for a degrowth world. We gather locally and nationally every month or so to learn for, from each other, share updates and discuss plans and projects. The gatherings are dynamic and open and we make them what we want and encourage everyone equally to jump in with your ideas and make things happen. It's fun, come along, join us. Let's get this whole thing happening. Uh, for more information, please contact us and the other group we're collaborating with to make this whole week possible is Nina, New Economy Network Australia. And just moving this thing out of the way, Nina is a network of organizations and individuals working to create an ecologically healthy and socially just society by transforming Australia's economic system. Nina works by providing a platform for knowledge sharing, peer-to-peer -peer support, cross-pollination of ideas and collaboration. We host hubs like Degrowth Hub that bring their ideas and knowledge into the wider framework. Get in touch. <laughs> there you go. And here's a bee. Ooh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and you know, bees aren't actually the main pollinators, right? Maybe, Jason, you know about this, but like flies are, are the main, like they're like really important. Flies I are like big, massive flies. But then there's this whole thing about bees. Anyway, uh, anyway, 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 that's good. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. So um, just a little bit of introduction. I came across Rob and Jason um, by listening to the incredible podcast, uh, Crazy Town. Um, I don't know how I got onto that, but I think I was just scrolling through like, climate crisis stuff on you know podcasts searching for things and i came across crazy town and it looked kind of cool with this kind of world and like a mohawk fire symbol and i was thinking oh yeah try that out and as soon as i started listening i just totally clicked with the humor that like awesome way of like just taking the piss out of the craziness that we're in on this planet but mixed with like hyper intelligent um kind of um concepts and ideas and explaining just how we ended up in this mess <laughs> so yeah that's how I got into it um but yeah I don't want to say too much more I'll, I'll just hand it over to Rob and Jason who are more than capable of the goonery <laughs> and the and the intelligence <laughs> to kind of carry this off so uh over to you uh over to you two thanks so much for coming it's been it's great to finally have you 
Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Uh, I love the Tanya. idea of intelligent goonery. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> that's great. Um, well, thanks to Nina and DNA and you, Tanya, for inviting us. Uh, it's it's really awesome to be part of Degrowth Week. Uh, we're of course invited here because of the the hosting that we do with Crazy Town, which is a project of the Post Carbon Institute. If you want to find us on the web, you can go to postcarbon.org, also resilience.org. Uh, we are missing a Cher Miller, our third uh, compadre in this uh, affair. He actually had the gall to go on on vacation. Uh, so uh, maybe that's a, a degrowth mindset too. take a break every once in a while. Um, Jason and I are coming to you from the Willamette Valley, uh, which is in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest, unceded lands of the Kalapuya and many other peoples. Um, beautiful, beautiful country, lots of ecological challenges, but also uh, entirely inspiring habitats and ecosystems all around us. So um, I always like to mention the ecosystem. It's uh, largely oak savanna, um, or supposed to be anyway. Um, a lot of it's been uh, taken over by farming, some better than others, yours, Jason, uh, included. Uh, before we tell you more about Crazy Town, uh, we have to share a brief message from our sponsor, as uh, you know, that's what you have to do in Crazy Town. Yeah, Jason? Uh, we got to pay the bills. and. Um... Rob, you are going to be so happy with who I got this week because um, I put the word out that we were um, we were going to be um, working uh, on on a on a gig in Australia, and um, and so that um, that really you know shook the tree so to speak, right? And I was able to come up with a great sponsor that understood the context here, so. Um, let me just let me just read uh, read the the copy they sent. The National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, or NASCAR, North America's most iconic and popular auto sport, has partnered with Aspiradac of Australia on an ambitious plan to create the first ever carbon neutral racing series. Net Zero NASCAR will shove three thousand tons of CO two per year into underground formations in South Australia after being grabbed out of the air by Asparadax solar powered technology. Asparadax devices can remove two tons of CO2 per year, and this partnership will fund the construction of 1500 units. Together, we can offset the emissions of our races while generating a thunderous chorus of self-congratulatory corporate doublespeak, the volume of which can only be matched by the ear splitting noise of attending a race. Net zero NASCAR, putting our carbon down under, down under. So uh, really, really happy uh, that we have those folks here back in our show. Yeah, you always get such good sponsors, Jason. And, you know, if any of you want to know how to get them uh, and, and bring in the huge dollars that Crazy Town generates, you know, just just look up Jason. He's he's a master of it. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> well, uh Card of it. We uh, sincerely are excited to be presenting uh, to Australians. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, Jason, you've been over to the continent, right? A couple times, been 25 years, but uh, I, I, I'm actually, I probably felt more relevant in Australia than any <laughs> other place I've ever been because I actually am a taxonomic expert on a family of plants that is unknown to North Americans. So when I walk around and I say what I do, people are like, what, what the hell is that? But when in Australia, people were like, oh, you're the guy who, who studies Cunoniaceae, huh? So I walk into the National Herbarium and I held my head high and you know, chest puffed out. And I try not to be a tall poppy though, because I know Australians don't like that. So I try to keep it cool, but there was a sense of pride um, so coach wood, leather wood, uh, the New South Wales Christmas bush, um, and um, a black wattle. Uh, these are the kind of plants. Oh, Davidson's plum. You're all familiar with them, I'm sure. Um, so anyway, it's well, good to be talking to Aussies because they know my plants. 
I, uh, I've never been on the continent, but for one reason or another, and I bet it's word of mouth from listeners like Tanya, it turns out that residents of Melbourne listen to us more than any other city in the entire world. And Sydney, yeah. Brisbane, Perth, and Adelaide also listen a lot. So uh, we're honored, actually, to be with, with our Australian friends. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about the crazy town worldview, uh, kind of a almost a, a synopsis of, of how we look at things. Uh, our, our first uh, method is that we laugh uh, mostly so that we don't cry. Um, I think these times, you know, if you're following the news on climate or biodiversity, there, there's a pretty good call for dark humor. Uh, the second thing, uh, really the reason why we put this show together is we kind of wanted to develop community or, or something like a commiseration space. Um, I think, Tanya, you kind of uh, brought it up in your intro. It's like you're, you're, you're getting kind of sad or, or you know, beaten down by what's happening, and you, you want to make sure that you're not alone in this. So we try to uh, offer some camaraderie and, and commiseration on that front. And then the third thing that we do is uh, we know these are heavy topics that we address and we're poking a lot of fun and, and tackling them head on. Um, and it's one thing to make fun of stuff and critique stuff, but uh, it's much more challenging to present what you could think of as an appropriate response. So uh, we try to offer our listeners uh, ways forward, you know, not, not that we're going to solve all these problems that, uh, that we're addressing, but that uh, we we want to have a, a decent way to respond to them. And um, I'm going to share my screen here because, you know, I, I can tell you all day what the show is about, but I want to offer some examples um, that, that Jason and I can go through. So let's see, let me get this set up for you. Okay, you should be able to see the screen. There's our silly, crazy town logo. Um, also, I, I said how we were uh, missing a share. Uh, this is us in the studio. He's the guy in the back that's uh, that's staring kind of straight at you. So um, thanks to him as well for helping get this show going. Um, Jason, you want to give an example? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, what's interesting is 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 degrowth is so obvious, right? Every, everyone's walking around you're like of, of course I, I think it should be called shrinkage just get to the point but but it's okay you know you, we can argue about this forever but anyhow um there was a there was an announcement early this year to on earth day our president biden basically announced that every vehicle in the united states military was going to be climate friendly every vehicle no i mean it I mean, that's what he could do on Earth Day is, is sort of net neutralize the military somehow. Right? Well, let me tell you, we were we were recording an episode uh, and a share and I came over to Jason's house, which is where our studio is set up. And uh, I thought, Jason, your head was going to explode or at least you were going to start bleeding out of your ears because I, I remember that you were you were like Earth Day. This is our yeah, this, is Earth this is our Day. grand this is Earth Day speech. Yeah, that's the best our president could do on Earth Day. So yeah, you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, so that's kind of the um, uh, the issue, right? Is uh, I think Biden's just confusing the idea of green with uh, mm. you know with with lowering emissions because yeah, most of our military vehicles are green, so that's a that's a start, right? That makes uh, a lot of sense. Now I understand him better. Thank you. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, yeah, he does get bad. confused. Yeah. Um, I want to share something that's uh, that explains the concept of crazy town, and and the basics of it are that you're wondering like what what is going on here? Am I the only one who sees this as being completely illogical? So what you're looking at here is a map of the southwestern United States. Um, uh, the yellow square or rectangle there is what I'm going to zoom in on here. Um, and this is in the region of the lower Colorado River. The Colorado River is uh, probably one of the most storied rivers on this continent. 
It's what carved the Grand Canyon, uh, just an amazing, amazing natural feature. Um, once it comes out of the Grand Canyon and, and flows south towards Mexico, um, you've just got series of dams and then lots of irrigation. And so what you see here, uh, this is a map where the pink in these uh, areas is actually uh, farms of alfalfa. And alfalfa is just turned into hay for cattle feed. Um, so we're, we're growing cattle feed in the desert using the water of, uh, uh, of the Colorado River. And this, when I say desert, I mean, I, I've been to this area a lot when it's been 117 degrees Fahrenheit outside. I mean, it is a hot, hot I, I desert. think they speak, do they speak Celsius there mostly? You have to translate that for them. Oh my gosh, don't make me do any math or conversions. That's probably like upper 40s or something, isn't it? I don't know. It, it's hot enough that you want to pass out. I mean, you could bake cookies in an oven at that temperature. Yes, they're um, Celsius people. Like the rest, so, like the sensible people, they're Celsius right, people. Right, right. Well, you know, we're American idiots and, and we can only stay that way, right? That's, <sighs> yeah, I think sad. it's upper 40s. It's pretty darn hot. Okay. So uh, the, the punch town of this, though, is that... Uh, or the punch line of this is that, and why you know you're in crazy town is that we can't even, we don't even use the alfalfa here. Most of it uh, is bought and shipped to Saudi Arabia, uh, where it is illegal over there to grow alfalfa in the desert. So it's, the, we grow it here in our desert, we can kind of wreck the ecology there. And, and then, you know, send it in the global trade over to Saudi Arabia to feed their dairy cattle. So, and, and, you know, we, we are, I mean, Jason, Asher and I, we often are asked like, this makes no sense, no sense whatsoever uh, from an energy perspective. Are we, are we nuts? You know, are, are we the, the insane ones? And uh, that's kind of the crazy town. You're looking all around you and, and wondering, how did I get here? How, how, wh why is this the way things are? Yes. Um, and we try to yeah. explore why things, how we got here to try to make, you know, how do you make sense of the insanity? Like what were all the steps that led to this complete nuttiness? Um, it's still, it, it, you know, anyway, it helps a little bit, I think. But, uh, but yeah, there, I mean, this is one of my, I think if anyone has any things like this that they can share to drive us all crazier, uh, that would be great. <laughs> Just put it in the chat. Uh, Cause I get, I start getting amped up. I start getting it's 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 exciting and horrible at the same time. I don't know what this. I don't know if there's a name for this feeling, but this is another one that got me. Is that somebody drafted a proposal to have a flying cruise ship, and this was the sketch. I, and, and apparently they were serious. Uh, 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 and I, I, I guess this thing was never actually supposed to land. So they were going to have like, it was just going to fly around the world continually. And they would send fuel ships up, uh, you know. So there's like, anyway, anyway. I you can see, you can see how this would just. You, how do you do this? How, how do you how do you live through this? To me, the best part is these kinds of uh, proposals that get floated get millions and millions of of views yes. and likes. Like people are really excited for the future yeah. that includes I, this. Uh, yeah, this gets put this. on Facebook, and there's like thousands of comments. I post something on Facebook and I get two. Yeah. And most yeah. of those are are crickets that are uh, that are commenting on yours. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So um so that that's really the the whole premise of the show is, you know, we're meant to be a place where people living in crazy town can uh kind of take a look at what's going on and and process it and then hopefully think of some other other things we can do. And I have to say, in a way, we've kind of stolen this idea from the story of Ken Ward, who is a, a climate and environmental activist here in the US. And there was a documentary that was created about him called The Reluctant Radical. And in our very first episode, we we talk about it. He, you know, it, it was around Christmas time here, and he was really sick of the consumerism. And he thought, what am I going to do for Christmas? Am I just going to unwrap presents? No, I'm going to dress up in a Santa Claus suit, go down to my local gas station and protest 
that, that we're still buying and using fossil fuel. And so he goes down there and the police come out and, and they tell him, if you don't step away, we're going to arrest you. And he kind of says, OK, well, I guess you got to arrest me. And, he, you know, he goes off and goes to jail for for his protest. Uh, and, and anyway, he ended up going to see a, uh, a psychiatrist to, to sort of say, look, I know I'm not the normal citizen. Like I keep finding that I need to go out and protest these things. I need to try to raise awareness. Am I crazy or is everybody else? And the psychiatrist said, well, maybe it's you um, and prescribed that can uh, get on on lithium, you know, a psychotropic drug and it you know it turns out lithium's good not just for the uh, future electric vehicle bonanza but also for quieting down the overactive minds of environmentalists so uh it, you know ken didn't really like the effects of the lithium and he he decided no it's it's not me that's crazy it's you know i'm right everybody else is is kind of messed up here and and uh that's that's what Jason is sharing, I think, too. I mean, as messed up as we are, we think we might be less less messed up than uh, than than some of the others. So um, so we want to take you through some of the uh, what we've figured out over the course of recording this show. We just completed our fifth season. Uh, so I want to run you through a little bit of the arc of of Crazy Town so far. Um, our first season was. Um, uh, what you'd call a, a welcome to crazy town. Um, and uh, I want to tell a little story. Our, our, our second episode was about continuous economic growth. So it really fits into the whole degrowth theme here. Um, uh, this is probably going back about a decade ago. Um, I was one of the planners for a national conference. It was a, a, a group called the National Council for Science and the Environment. And they had a a really big politically important conference in Washington, D.C. And somehow me and a colleague got on the board to, to help arrange this conference. And we, we basically made ecological economics the theme of it. And for those of you who, you know, if you're in the degrowth movement and, and have looked into steady state economics, you probably know Herman Daly's name. Herman Daly has done a lot to promote you know, what we would think of as a sustainable economy. We got him to be the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award at that conference. All of the sessions were about these ideas like Tanya brought up at the beginning, uh, how GDP is not a measure of progress. In fact, you could even use it as a measure of, of environmental degradation if you, um, if you took it in that vein. Uh, so just tons and tons of these kinds of presentations and ideas going on. Well, that uh, uh, particular conference was held in the Ronald Reagan building, uh, which is uh, a government building in the United States. And Reagan was kind of a, a key figure in this idea of perpetual economic growth. So I'm, I'm in the middle of this conference and I go into the main hall where the exhibits are. And I kid you not, this is the, the giant plaque. That thing was huge, uh, you know, probably measuring 30 feet across. And it, it's got the Reagan quote from his inaugural address where he says, there are no limits to growth in human progress when men and women are free to follow their dreams. Now, being Australian, you guys probably don't know, but that was a spot on, just perfect, perfect, perfect. impression of Reagan. I mean, right, Jason? Yeah. Uh, I, just, yeah, just exactly. I thought you. I thought you were playing a recording of them there. Weren't yeah. You? yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, th this is 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 happening there, and uh, we, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, again yeah, stepping into into crazy town. I mean, Jason, yeah. you when when I, we yeah. talked about this, you had some pretty severe reactions again. Yeah, I, I wanted to punch. I wanted to punch Ronald Reagan in the mouth if I had the chance. You know, I I, I don't feel good about that feeling that happened. But I had it. I, I acknowledged it. You know. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, when you when you uttered that, you would have had to sort of dig up his grave and punch a dead person yeah, in the mouth, which fair. is even even fair. worse. Yeah. That's worse. I feel terrible. <laughs> I mean, when you read something like this, like of course it kind of resonates if you're not a thoughtful person or you haven't considered where we're going. Uh, so I mean, it's really hard to uh, to come up with 
with something that would work. I mean, uh, so all of our shows, we we might go through an analysis um, of, of what's happening and, and where an idea came from. But one of the other things we try to do, as I said, is, is offer some responses or what, what we've come to call a do the opposite segment in the show. And when you're talking about perpetual economic growth on a finite planet, the do the opposite is obviously what you all are doing, degrowth. Uh, we want cooperatives instead of corporations, for example, as, as one of the policies that, that you might have there. Um, and, and in that episode, we kind of rewrote this line from Reagan, uh, where we said, uh, there are no limits to exploitation when men and women are free to make shit up. I mean, that's kind of what uh, this humans is. It's a great. giant, it's a great. giant wishful thinking. I mean, the, what the Americans are, are, are renowned for this though. Like, I guess, I, you know, you guys, you Australians can tell us if this is true or not, but my impression is that we're renowned for being kind of manic and sort of like always thinking that, you know, we can you know, follow our dreams and, and make whatever we want of ourselves. And there aren't, you know, our parents are, are less likely to say, uh, I'm sorry, you know, you're probably not going to be, you know, very successful in life. They don't say that kind of stuff. You know, everyone thinks that they, they can just come out on top somehow. That's a very American, I think. So Reagan sort of encapsulated that. Well, I mean, really well. and uh, it turns out that 97% of Americans believe that uh, Marvel movies are documentaries. Yeah. So, that's true. you know, the, the power. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I well, mean, I, 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 know, I, I'm pretty sure, Jason, you're Spider Man. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Secret identity. Don't, uh, don't let that you're, out. You're the Flash. You're the Flash. Um, hey, but, wrong uh, cinematic universe, my friend. Uh, did I cross cinematic universes? Yeah. Okay. okay well, uh, uh, so another example, Jason. Why don't you yeah. uh, okay. talk so, about energy uh, literacy? A big thing that we decided to do is just sort of really explain how you know why do we think we're superheroes? Why do we think we're superheroes? Why do we think it's even possible to just to be a superhero? Because the amount of energy and fossil fuels. And the US was the, the king of fossil fuels. We we're the first place to exploit the liquid fossil fuels to such an extent. Of course, you know, there's coal was king and stuff in the UK. And but when you we got the the oil, the oil boom, the oil boom, that that was awesome. And we have this big continent and trains were moving across and then roads and stuff and then planes. And so it's like winning the lottery and but thinking you're smart you know, and that uh, you, you're deserving of something. And and people that do that, um, you know, often do stupid stuff. Like, you know, dumb, dumb money. You came into it, you've got way too much of it, and you just start throwing it around and in, in, in malinvestments one after the other. And, yeah. and that's a lot of what we've done, basically, we, in our civilization. And America, yeah. I guess, we're we're the best at that, perhaps. Yeah, so uh, one example that I saw recently of our uh, sort of misspending our lottery winnings, I, I had the chance to go to Moab, Utah, which uh, I love to ride bikes and I love mountain biking, biking on trails. And Moab is probably considered one of the top places for mountain bike trail riding in the world. And uh, it had been a dream of mine for pretty much my entire, uh, well, the last 30 years to go there. And I finally did. And yes, it's awesome. Yes, there are trails. You can bike around. But the Jeep culture there uh, just mm -hmm. dominated the mountain bike culture. So, I mean, I would literally see this with a line of Jeeps following each other. I can't even, uh, like riding in one of those jeeps behind another the exhaust fumes that you're smelling while uh you know crawling along at, at five miles per hour through the they're desert they're working on I, electric versions though don't worry <laughs> yeah i know right right yeah. don't worry. They're coming. Uh, they're maybe maybe right you right don't forward. need it anymore you can just take that flying cruise ship and uh yeah. you know and cruise over the hills but you know that, to me that's a, a total misinvestment of our fossil fuels i mean the just the you know the value that's that's in inside of each barrel of oil to use it this way let's see, when let's you can see be, if we have let's let people in the chat 
see if they're going to argue with you here. Does anyone want to argue with Rob? This is a bad <laughs> investment. If you go ahead, we're, we're, we're open to feedback here. Maybe there are a lot of people who like this, Rob. Let's not I, I could be wrong. There, there were uh, two or three Jeep shows in the town of Moab, you know, people comparing yeah. who's whose tire was bigger than the other person's tire or how much yeah. horsepower uh, I got versus you. Is, or, yeah, real, real fun. Oh, look, at there's someone knocking a Kiwi there. Yeah, look at that. Those Jeeps are nothing compared to the Oots in the New Zealand suburb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Okay. My one of my favorite, or I don't know, should I say favorite? I don't know what to call it. Again, I don't have words for this, but the ski Dubai, that's a good one. The ski Dubai is a good one, right? Which is going to be, uh, we should have a vote. If we can't, we vote. Can they vote? Which is, which is better or worse? Which is the worst? Which is the worst? Which is the better worst? This is the better worst by far. Are you kidding okay. me? A ski okay. hill in Dubai? Okay, okay. You're even you're even admitting that. I know. I yeah. can't. No one can compete with it. But compete. I bet it was a good dollar investment. Whoever built uh -huh. this thing is probably making a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. we don't I don't we don't call them Utes around here, but we have we have giant my son, my son goes crazy too, because America's great at building giant things. The Hummer, come on. And but almost every single truck brand went from like a reasonable size truck, the same brand, the same like model, like Tacomas are now gigantic and they only have the same names there, but yeah, well, the, everything is huge. And the best part is they're all named after the stuff they're destroying, yes. you know, like we the, have Denali, the Denali, the Denali yeah, or the, the yeah. Tundra. Yes. You know, the it's, Toyota it's, Tundra. Yes. It's great. Yeah. You we're know, sorry I, about SUVs. I think we might've started that. I feel terrible. Yeah. But one of the things we try to do then is like is see the is encourage people to see the world through this energy lens, right? Become literate, uh, look at something like this and go, oh my gosh, um, can you believe what's behind that? Like th this is no, this is so out of whack from a world that's sort of centered on human power and and any of our, any history of human beings. Um, you know, they imagine pushing a car uphill if it breaks down. You just realize how ridiculous it is, and and so. <laughs> You know, a barrel of oil is like 12 years of hard work, right? Um, and it has the same amount of energy as, as um, you know, it's worth, it would be worth like 750,000 Australian dollars, a barrel of oil that at paying someone 30 Australian dollars, 30 Australian, I, amazing you did the conversion Australian dollars. Yeah, on top really, of our game here. Yeah. I'm really proud of you. So, um, and right now it's like, you know, hundred and something Australian dollars for a barrel of oil. So, so that, that's the kind of thing we try to do a lot is like put stuff in perspective. So if you want to understand why the world, the way it is, is that you're able to buy, you know, 12 years of work for a hundred dollars, essentially that. And, and so of course that's, what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a, a, a real eye opener for me over the years, sort of try, trying to convert from viewing the world through money and pop culture to viewing it through energy and life instead, um, you know, as, uh, and that's one of the things we're trying to do overall at Post Carbon Institute is help people understand that this is not a normal time that that we live in and, and that these fossil fuels, you know, it's, it's easy to just kind of say, oh, we, you know, Climate is such an issue, and we, we should end the fossil fuel era, era which we would agree with. But uh, the magic and the energy density of those fuels is just, at least in the United States, is is hardly understood. Um, yeah. You know, and it's just seen as an entitlement. You know, that I can drive whatever vehicle I want, or get wherever I want, or make my place as cool as I want. Not even really considering what's behind all that. Um, and then speaking of, of kind of uh, not normal, uh, our second season of Crazy Town, uh, we kind of uh, called it a farewell to normalcy because that's when COVID hit. And uh, I think everybody experienced that in probably a uh, outside of normality kind of way as, you know, our business as usual got shut down. Um, even our lowly podcast had to adapt and we moved 
from uh, a nice studio in Jason's house to uh, to an outdoor space, kind of a greenhouse with all the windows open. And to show you just how green uh, our podcast mm. is, this yeah. critter here, this um, Pacific tree frog became our mascot. That's it was kind of funny. Two mascot. That's right. Yeah, we we were uh, we'd be doing recordings and you'd start hearing this guy uh, chirping, croaking. And it was my job. Decibels. Yeah, it was my job to go try to quiet it. And then we realized it, it sounded a lot better than any of the three of us. So we just let it go. Uh, from do they, do, on, do, they so. do decibels in Australia? Is that the same? Met- do they do decibels. They have a decibel system there. Like, do they understand that? Is that? Is yeah, they do. Uh, they do Australian decibels. Right? Okay, I'm just sorry. <laughs> but you know what's interesting <laughs> is I feel like the slowing down that happened in COVID, the the the, the not traveling as much, right? The being a little more more around the home. I kind of feel like that was a little glimpse into maybe what what we'll have to face, right? And um, and this happens every once in a while, sure, when there's sort of emergencies of various kinds, but that was, it was like kind of prolonged, right? And um, and services during COVID and since then have not been quite as, I don't know about in Australia, but in, in the United States, it's a lot harder to get appointments with professionals. Things just seem to be kind of clunky, you know, airplane flights. I, I'm not, I haven't, I, everyone that I know has been flying lately, which a lot of people do in the summer. It's, it's just like a mess. And um, so, so I think part of what we talked about a lot in that season was, you know, get used to some of these inconveniences, figure out how to be happy uh, with less of this sort of what we call high energy modernity conveniences. What is it like to really focus on your place and 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 the things that are wonderful there. And I think the frog was a great example of that, how we kind of, you know, tuned into the, the high decibels of this little Pacific tree frog. Well, I, I remember we talked a lot too about, uh, you know, or maybe even joked, what, what are you going to miss and not miss about high energy modernity? And it's kind of yeah. easy, like, I, you know, I always said, yeah, yeah we, we, that's an easy one. Modern dentistry is pretty yeah. fun. Uh, well, I, fun, that's the wrong word, but uh, better than I the alternative, of, right? I, I, I don't want to bang out my teeth with a rock, you know? Yeah, I get my teeth clean one extra time a year, you know, instead of every six months was a standard. I said, can I come more often? And they're like, sure, you just have to pay. I'm like, how much? hundred bucks. Like, that's so worth it. So yeah, yeah every that's... every four months. Way it's back. like the cost of a barrel of oil. No problem. Exactly. I know. I just <laughs> love laying back and have someone like those those feet, those fish that go clean other fish's stuff. I love maybe, it. Maybe maybe you should try it that way. I think that's a that's a good idea. But oh, then there's course. there's things that we will not absolutely not miss that will make life better. Uh, I don't know how much in your towns uh, these things get used. But, uh, when I was, uh, way back when I was going to college in the summers, I used to work on a landscape crew and the last couple of hours of every day, we would don this huge backpack blower, gas powered, two stroke engine, and just blow grass clippings and dirt all over the place. Yeah, and I, blow, not, not, yeah. not to get too gross, but I mean, I would go home at the end of the day and I would blow my nose and it would be like uh, I was working in a coal mine or something. I mean, this just black sludge would, uh, would come out and, and that's not even the worst of it. It's the sound of those things. And you're, what are you getting out of it? You're getting n- almost nothing. Uh, just some silly move, some grass clippings from here to there. So uh, yeah, I'm, leaf blowers am... in Australia. Do they have, I don't remember that. I was focused on the plants so much when I was there. <laughs> But I, if someone could maybe say, let us know if they have loud leaf blowers there. Yeah, yeah. so not not going to miss that one, yeah. one bit. Um, okay, season three. What happened in season three? So season three was a, we started delving a little deeper because we were, uh, there was somebody who liked our show so much that she wanted to volunteer with us. And we had these ideas. Uh, her name is Alana. We had some ideas of how we could, really take the show to another level. And uh, we wanted to explore the hidden drivers behind our sustainability crises. And um, and we, you know, we had done a little bit of research, but then we were able to turn it over to her to, to really find some good resources for us. And um, uh, I, I really thought it was interesting to look at things. And w- uh, one of the 
uh, topics where I knew absolutely nothing about it before going into this season is the idea of terror management theory, or this notion that it, fear of death drives a lot of, of human behavior. Now, this freaked me and, out, by the way, this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell tell me about the psych experience. Tell about the psych experiments. I, I'll, I'm going to get to it, dark. but I, but I want to first talk about how there, you know, all, all animals, all of us, uh, all of us animals understand that, that, you know, we're sort of aware of death and how I know this is a little experience I had with this critter here, which is a mole. Uh, my friend Jeremy and I were actually standing on my porch and I had this little planted area next to it that had some gravel in it. And we were just talking one evening and the gravel started like humping up and we're like, what the hell's going on? And we go over there and then we see this, this emerge just like that. It looked exactly like that. And my That's friend they Jeremy, like. they're incredible. He, they're incredible. He's a biologist. They're he, blind. He goes they over there it. and he grabs it on the back and picks it up in his hand and turns it over and we're looking at it. And the most shocking thing happened. This mole screamed just like a human. I mean, it was, I, I'm not going to scream at you all, but no, it, it, it literally sounded like a human screaming to a, you know, it didn't want to have this, this death moment. It was, and they don't so, know moles. And I'll, I'll, they're about this big, right? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it could fit in the palm of his hand with the head hanging off yeah. and these yeah, yeah. big flipper paddles. They're Australians. You know? They don't have they don't have placental mammals. They have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so there's probably uh, a, there might be a mar marsupial version though. Maybe probably is yeah. probably like a wombat. Yeah, but so humans differ in that uh, we're also aware of death, but we, we can contemplate it uh, probably on a, another level of depth beyond what a mole and, and some other creatures tend to. Um, and it turns out there's sort of this balance point between, on the one hand, knowing it a little bit and feeling anxious that you, you're going to die one day, versus on the other hand, really understanding that in your bones and making peace with it. So this idea that if you if you don't do that second bit, if you don't make peace with the idea that you're going to die, there's all these psychological problems that we have. So uh, the notion is that somebody who hasn't grappled with death, when they get reminded by someone that they're going to die, it, it can influence them to all kinds of nutty behaviors like scapegoating out groups, clinging to symbols of our insular culture, and, and even making us more willing to inflict harm on one another. So, you know, is essentially we don't operate with open minds and open hearts. And, um, you know, so that diminishes the connections that we can have with each other, diminishes our connection to nature. So, you know, the, the do the opposite here with this is we've got to learn to make peace uh, with death. And, and I got to say, one of the most connecting conversations and relationship experiences I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, was when I had an uncle who was going through esophageal cancer, and uh, he was given uh, a choice, essentially, you can undergo this treatment, or you're going to die. And uh, we ended up having some of the most heartfelt conversations about what he wanted to do uh, with that, that choice. And I think through grappling with that, um, he, he just got to a much better place. So, you know, the, the notion of uh, death anxiety as a key piece of sustainability was yeah, a, a true hidden driver, mm -hmm. I, I think, for all three of us in crazy town. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. And, you know, this idea that how do you keep yourself open and 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 less fearful? Um, and of course, Michael Pollan had just had a book out about about psychedelics. So that, that sort of came up to how to change your mind. Um, so that, yeah, but, uh, anyway, we should keep moving through. We got two, we got another couple seasons to go. Oh over. yeah. We can, we can blast through these. So, so then we, we kind of got into a historical look, uh, in a season that we called watershed moments. You know, the idea is once you can understand some of these hidden drivers behind humanity's predicament of overshoot, where we're consuming resources faster than the earth can replenish them. We thought it would be fun to look at fun, right? To look at some of the pivotal moments in history 
uh, where we took a wrong turn. And so we call these watershed moments. Um, this is, again, some artwork that uh, another volunteer, Anya Sire, did for us. Uh, and this episode was called Hippos in the Bayou, and it was about introduced species. And so the, the, the moment happened in, in the year 1910, where uh, the so-called hippo bill came within a millimeter of becoming law in the United States. And the idea was we were gonna bring hippos uh, into our bayous or swamps down along the, uh, the Gulf Coast of the US. And there were two purposes. One was for meat. So you can imagine mm -hmm. McDonald's would just uh, mm -hmm. revel in the idea of having McHippo nuggets. Yes, you know? unbelievable. Each, each one of those burgers. nuggets could be shaped like a little, little little hippo oh, little butt, just, hippo butt yeah it'd be delicious uh oh. the, and then, well, the, the second was an invasive species the water hyacinth the the idea there was choking uh commerce this this invasive plant and so they thought the hippos would um would actually uh eat the water hyacinth but of course anyone who knows hippo ecology and feeding behavior knows that they they hang out in the water during the day and then they get out of the water and they graze on the land at night and uh, so they they would have just ignored this aquatic plant. Uh, so it's it just ridiculous in every respect. But that <laughs> that's that went to the highest levels of our government and almost passed. Well, and uh, uh, this episode had some pretty amazing stories in it. Uh, there's actually a currently unfolding hippo invasion happening in Colombia, yes, in South America, where some uh, you know pet hippos escaped from a pond at the compound of the uh, drug kingpin, Pablo Escobar. Great, so, cocaine, dealer, uh, great cocaine dealer. Oh yeah, yeah, your, yeah. your main supplier. But uh, you know, after he mm -hmm. got killed, uh, his pond had four hippos and he had a whole menagerie of animals. And a lot of the um, like biologists went in and captured these animals and shipped them off to zoos. But they were like, I'm not getting near hippos because uh, you know, a little trivia, but uh, hippo attacks uh, end in fatality more often than shark attacks. So, I mean, this is a this is a rough animal to uh, to try yeah. to corral. So they just kind of left them. And um, uh, biologists now estimate that there's going to be 400 to 800 hippos in the Magdalena River Basin by 2050. So they're mm. panning out and, uh, you know, doing what they do. I know, I know the, uh, the Aussies here are pretty sensitive to this because invasive species are a big problem, you know, cane toads and, and wabbits and all those sort of things, but, and they take that seriously, but I, I, there's something I'd like to bring, I'd like to import to North America, because I'm thinking about the future and the need for greater self-reliance and, and livestock are part of that in my view. And um, if I think about the platypus and what it's capable of. I mean, marsupials are awesome, but monotremes, for God's sakes, the eggs, the <laughs> the milk, you know, you can get the little kids, so it's a little monotreme milking or something like that. I don't know how you squeeze them out. Um, and uh, fur like beavers, right? I mean, wonderful, I'm sure, aquatic mammals. And uh, anyway, I, I'm just throwing it out there. If anyone wants to partner with me on a on a platypus um, kind of resilient homesteader sort of uh, domestication program, uh, let me know, and uh, we'll, we'll work together. As usual, Jason, uh, you make a great case for doing the opposite, uh, uh, which would be uh, maybe have a little reverence for nature every once in a while. Um, you know, maybe a little eco. Look, you're supposed to be the ecologist. Could you bring some ecological literacy to the uh, to the program here? You know, it's it's a little late here. It's the afternoon. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm. I, you guys are on coffee. I'm on ethanol right now. Okay. I apologize yeah. if I offended anybody. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's move on. That was yeah. That was my, move that was on. My... Take us take us to our most offensive season, which is the most recent in our our okay. false prophets. This was a, this was probably the toughest season um, because we had to deal with some of the 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 worst human beings we could find on the planet um, and and I I did I like I I, I previewed I'm a scientist I've written a, dozens of papers on on the taxonomy the the evolutionary history of the Cunoniaceae family of plants and I took all that vast background 
in <laughs> evolutionary biology and phylogenetics. And I researched the, the species of false prophets. I have a very, uh, very popular paper out in the literature right now. It's called the species level taxonomic treatment of the false prophets with hypotheses on their origin evo and evolution. And so you'll, you'll recognize these people, um, uh, the, 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 the species um, Homo spiritus industriae, the, the, the common name is industrial breatharians. These, tip, these tend to be economists who believe we can dematerialize so we can keep growing the economy, um, but we don't need molecules. Um, so, you know, you have a, you'll eventually have sort of a, a you know, Qantas, is it Qantas the airline or quantum? Qantas, right? <laughs> imagine, imagine, imagine the planes flying somehow without materials. Anyhow, those are the industrial breatharians. They're pretty awful. Um, Homo phallus are the rocket men. There's only a few of them and they're compensating big time, but we know these people, they, you have to be a billionaire and it still needs something more. Um, now, this one hits a little close to home. I, I admit that I, there's probably elements of this in me. This is um, uh, Homo immature Cassandra or the premature Cassandra later. And so this basically, these are people that Kind of basically get the story right of sort of you know ecological overshoot and decline, um, but they call it early. They call it early. So anyhow, um, this was a way to structure our conversation for the season and and profile uh, a lot of the, the specimens of these of these various species in our in our genus Homo. Yeah. Now I'll say that we tried hard to stick to the topics. Myth yes. of progress, neoliberalism, eco-modernism, doomerism, all this stuff. But uh, we failed sometimes. We we yes. got a little punchy and sarcastic and angry at some of the false prophets we chose. Uh, I'll give you an example. They're all more famous and richer than we are. Oh yeah, we we definitely punched up. No, I mean yes. it doesn't take much to doesn't be more famous much. and richer yeah. than us. I mean, what what are we even <laughs> talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> but that's so frustrating because they're just, they're ridiculous. Yeah. Well, and, so like, anyhow. There you go. You're about to start bleeding out of your, it's a good thing you're wearing those headphones. So yeah, we can't no one can see, see the, the blood. spurting blood <laughs> of the ears right now. But, but one of them was Mark Jacobson, a, a Stanford professor. And unbelievable. Uh, they're always at the, they're always at the most prestigious universities too, well, all these people. He has one of the most frustrating aspects that a lot of our false prophets share, which is, you can nod your head along with what he's saying. I mean, his basic premise is we need to switch to a renewable energy economy. Okay, great, let's do that. But his, that's where he gets it right. Where he gets it wrong is that he doesn't think there's a single technical barrier to doing that. It's just, it's only a political problem, no worries. Uh, we can all live lives of luxury and it'll be powered by a magical green energy source and a bunch of techno wonders, so. Uh, I really like to do the opposite. You you basically came up, Jason, with some filters for how to deal with that. Yeah. So our our culture, you know, the, our, our our highly industrialized, complex civilization is going to be looking for for a way out, which basically doubles down on more technology, more complexity, and that's what it. That's how it got to this place. And it doesn't seem to understand that that you, you that's that's the wrong direction to keep going. They're just keep pushing that. And so whenever you get a press release, you know, um, I'm not including the one from our sponsor though. Okay, that's cool. But aside from our sponsor, you know, promoting direct air capture, um, the opposites are, you know, beware of the scale of what's being proposed take off the energy blinders. Realize there's probably tons of energy behind this technology. Realize that a lot of things take so long to implement these, these big techno changes and time is not on our side. And that the complexity themselves of all these technologies will confound them. They're unlikely to fit together and be maintained properly in a, in a, in a descent of sort of our energy and, our, and limits. And then if we're trying to prolong growth, we do that at our peril anyway. So those are sort of the the adages I have. Yeah, yeah. 
I thought those were, were really good and lot, lots of food for thought. All right, we want to leave you all, uh, besides telling you about some of the content that we've we've created, we want to just leave with a little bit of a message about how to navigate crazy town. Uh, it's probably the case that all of us, uh, to some degree or another, are living in it. Um, so one of the one of the ideas is you want to cultivate uh, what our colleague Richard Heinberg dubbed informational competence. And what we mean by that is think in systems, understand feedbacks, cause and effect, and 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 try to take a bigger picture view of how things fit together. Also, of course, critical thinking. You know, being able to uh, you know difference between being cynical and being critical. Critical is is having a, a kind of a skeptical eye on on things. Um, and then we've also been looking into exploring other ways of being and thinking, especially indigenous pathways. Um, we're big fans of Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is trying to combine uh, the science of ecology and the wisdom of, of indigenous culture. Um, we interviewed uh, one of your uh, uh, country people, Tyson Yunkaporta, had some really interesting things to share. So uh, just different ways of thinking and, and seeing the world. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we do advocate facing reality, um, but you also can't be constantly churning in your brain about this stuff because we're up against, you know, this giant system that it, it's, it's really hard to change and it probably won't change until things are really catastrophic, which is starting to happen, of course. So face reality, but also know how to back away from this this sort of difficult subject matter and and the stuff that disempowering because you feel like you're small. And but finding other people. So this is where you have to find this is where the groups like this is are important. Finding people that that understand this and can you can talk and, and and deal with it together and then connect with nature as much as possible as well. So that's how you can get emotionally resilient. Yeah, and, and we also recommend trying to do some practical stuff, you know, address whatever vulnerabilities you face in this high energy modernity world. You know, how can you simplify and pull away from that? Um, pick up skills, some of which you might not think of off the bat, but things like uh, how to administer first aid or how to mediate conflicts. We're likely to see a lot of person to person conflict. Um, and just do projects, even small stuff. Uh, it not only can help your community or your own household situation, but uh, helps with with your mental health. And uh, I, I think just kind of doing stuff is always a, a, a good way forward. And it, it's it's not easy for us, but we also find that you know finding a way to keep your sense of humor, find joy in the presence, you know, the, the techniques of meditation to be present and realize you're okay right now, perhaps. And it's still a beautiful, amazing world. Um, and keep on, you know, laughing and, and just being the best human you can right now. Yeah, we, uh, we love laughing together and uh, hope you all have, have found some laughs and enjoy in this. The, the, the degrowth movement is about, uh, the most inspiring thing that, that I see out there. I've been, um, you know, following this idea of ecological economics for years. It was such a relief to find it. So I uh, wish you you all the best as you continue on this journey. And, and thank you, thank you, thank you again for inviting us. Thanks for listening and thanks for doing what you do. Uh, much appreciations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob and Jason. Um, just great. I love your um, incredible combination of just humor and, and just really intelligently kind of pulling apart the craziness of what's led us here. Just incredible. I think everybody agrees here. It's just been so refreshing on a on a Wednesday morning, halfway through Serious D Growth Week. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've been like laughing my face off the whole time. It just you're so unique and just have your heads around it in such a great way. The worldview of Crazy Town is just just really, really special. <laughs> it really oh, thanks good. so much. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has if anybody wants to stick around for a bit. I mean, Jason and Rob, if you've got to go, that that's cool, but